Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Bandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin. Welcome to the Total Connector show. It's all about total Bitcoin, total decentralization, total freedom, and it's about Bitcoin Austrian economics, my two special guests again are uh, Connor Brown and Eric Vasquez. You both know them. Uh, I put their links, um, their Twitter handle anyway into the show notes. But for those of you who are new, uh, Connor Brown um, uh, wrote a bunch of uh, wonderful, fascinating articles. Uh, where are you? I'm, I'm trying to find you over here. Connor Brown and Twitter handle. Um, is underscore Connor Brown underscore, and one of your uh, prominent uh, articles is uh, yeah on Medium.com. Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. I suggest anyone who is interested, please go read it and digest it. And all the other articles, Eric Vasquil, you know him. Uh, he again, uh, he he constantly writes very pretty short and sweet articles. Um, or commentaries on github.com, uh, Libitcoin. Uh, I think the last one was Money Taxonomy. Um, and um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for coming, Eric and Connor. And would you just, you know, just give us a, a short introduction maybe about yourself and um, thank you so much for, for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh... I'm Connor. I'm currently a law student and, um, you know, I'm, I'm just falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and trying to figure out what I'm going to do next in life, but, uh, really happy to be on here again. Hey, uh, I'm Eric. I, uh, um, I've worked for a few years, uh, on the Bitcoin, um, open source project and, uh, I, uh, I write and speak um, quite a bit on crypto economics. Um, I'm ex uh, US Navy and entrepreneur and investor and things like that. Things like that, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, um, Eric Connor. Um, so what, I'm, uh, what, I'm, what I wanna do, um, I, I just said previously before we start recording, I said I don't wanna, I really don't wanna have any kind of political discussion, but uh, and I don't want to sound like Donald Trump <laughs> when I say it's really huge that, uh, you know, <laughs> a, a, a reciting, you know, a president of the United States, whatever one thinks how much power he has or not. If we, if we think back about Kennedy trying to install, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when he tried to install an executive order, I think it was the number 11111 with a, sort of a governmental backed currency. And shortly after, I'm not saying it's the reason, but it was... I could have been one of the motives that he was assassinated, but you know this is just my 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 speculation. Um, so um, let me see. Uh, I want to recapitulate what what's been happening recently. Uh, so first of all, the Fed chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, in his uh, in in front of the Senate Banking Committee. Um, stated for the first time that Bitcoin is a store of value. Uh, and he emphasized it's a speculative store of value. And there's a bunch of quotes, you know, which I can cite right now. Um, and then he said, really, almost no one uses Bitcoin for payment. They use it more as an alternative to gold, really. It's a store of value. It's a speculative store of value like gold. And there was, you know, huge Twitter storms and um, even Peter Schiff <laughs> uh, going totally the opposite side. Um, but, and then, of course, it was the, the topic about Facebook's Libra uh, facing severe regulatory scrutiny. Yeah. And let me see if I find the quotes from Donald Trump. He says, uh, I'm not a fan of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, which are not money and whose value is highly volatile and based on thin air. Unregulated crypto assets can facilitate unlawful behavior, including drug trade and other illegal activities. Sounds familiar, but <laughs> um, so guys, you you already know these quotes. I'm just, you know, anybody who wants to read them, go on Twitter and just type in or Google it. Uh, but it's really worth reading. So 
I wanted to have, you know, both of, you know, uh, your opinions, your thoughts, your perspective. What is it? What does it mean? I mean, we could have never, I could have never imagined that, you know, the Fed chairman and the, and the president would publicly, uh, I mean, beyond the mainstream media now, uh, you know, more or less give us a, a f official statement um, on, on what they, you know, what's the position on, on cryptocurrencies or Facebook's Libra and especially Bitcoin. Uh, what do you think is happening right now? What does this mean for the process of, um, I'm just going to call it hyper-Bitcoinization or potential mass adoption or, or any kind of disbalances or balances that it could create within the, you know, the, the space of, 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 uh, of money and, and Bitcoin. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, you know, this is, it's a really big day. I mean, this is the day that we've been waiting for in a way. It's the day of acknowledgement um, by some of the most power pe powerful people in the world. Uh, I think it's an interesting uh, disconnect between the two different messages. Uh, on the Federal Reserve side, you have it seen for what I think it appropriately is, which is a store of value that is, you know, sort of evolving over time. And I think that the Fed chairman's comments on it were pretty smart. Uh, he definitely didn't say that um, it, it is never going to work or anything like that. And I think that he was a little bit uh, intentionally vague. Whether or not they see this as becoming the massive asset that we do, it's another question, but I think at least understanding it instead of uh, seeing it as just a payment platform and seeing it as a money, uh, I think is a really big step in the right direction. Um, Trump, on the other hand, you know, I think that this is the, the first uh, little bit of what Eric has been talking about, which is, you know, there's going to be a white market and a black market. Whether or not America is in the white market, who knows? Um, but, you know, I, I think that this is also a recognition in a way that this is a threat. The United States does get a large amount of its power from its control of the monetary supply um, and having the global reserve asset. Um, and, you know, it, you, you don't see tweet. I saw a, a tweet on, on uh, that was like, you know, I don't remember the last time the president was threatened by Beanie Babies. So, like, you know, obviously there's something happening here. I think that this really is sparked by Libra and not Bitcoin. Um, and I think that they see Libra as a threat or Trump or whoever is writing this tweet sees Libra as the real threat. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that's, again, they just don't quite understand the space yet. And I don't think Libra is a threat to them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big day either way. Yeah. <laughs> um. I agree with a lot of what you said, uh, Connor. Uh, you know, I, I, for me, me personally, you know, acknowledgement, recognition, all that, it's, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter that much. Um, you know, if you, if you know what, if you know what it is, you know where we are, nobody can really tell you where you are or what it is. Um, it's really more, um, more interesting to see, you know, what they're, what they want, want to do about it, how much they know, what they, what they, what they care. But um, I, I completely agree. This is this is about Facebook. There's I don't think there's much understanding at, at those levels, you know, about the distinction between Bitcoin and Facecoin. So um, clearly, you know, as I've, I've said many times, that that uh, you know, my money independent of the state is a threat to state revenue, and um, that that's not going to go. It's not likely to to just go by without notice uh, at some point. And I think Facebook is big enough. Um, and clearly, they, they've taken notice because of that. Um, you know, otherwise, if this if this wasn't the case, there'd be there would have been, you know, corporate or private monies um, in widespread use by now. It's just not legal to do, <laughs> you know, what what Bitcoin does, um, and um, it's just been too small for them to really care. Um, so. I don't know what, 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 there was a number of things you commented on that I uh, thought were interesting and useful. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, Jerome Powell? Wait, say that again? What are your thoughts on the Fed chair? 
the Fed chair. You see, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta fess up here. I, I stopped watching news or paying attention to politics <laughs> or voting about ten years ago. So, so what I get, what I get is all secondhand because none of it comes into my feed, doesn't enter my TV. I don't read papers, newspapers, things like that. I only, I only read the stuff I care about. So, um, I that. I, you say the name, I'm like, who? You know, I used to, I used to know all that stuff. Um, <laughs> So the comments by the Fed chair, specifically what? Because, again, I don't pay attention. Well, I mean, he, he's calling it a store value. And, oh, okay, that and, store value kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, this all this quibbling about whether it's a store value or a you know, medium of exchange or unit of account, I, it just is what it is. It doesn't matter what you know labels we put on it. Um, it's a money. Money has all these properties. And... Um, you know, people can, people can think about it what they want and say, well, it's a store of value and it looks like, you know, yeah, maybe it looks more like gold. That's fine. But you know, you can't send gold over a wire. There's, there's a lot of differences here. Um, so, um, I, but doesn't this statement, know. but Eric, doesn't this statement by itself by Fed chairman, I mean, you know, if the central, the privately owned controls, uh, central bank of the United States, uh, just saying it, whatever he think, whatever it, whether it's valid or not, whatever you know, what, however you know they relativize it. But doesn't it push more people or make people more aware, more conscious, more sure. critically thinking? This is what I, what I'm, why I'm so yeah, optimistic. No, no, you know? no question. I mean, people mm -hmm. that people that pay attention to those things are gonna, you know, think that's really important. Um, it may drive more people in. It may drive more people away. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's a, you know, it's a news event. <laughs> you know, somebody said something about Bitcoin. It's, you know, that's interesting. Um, or, or, Fet, or Facecoin, you know. Um, but I, I don't know. I just, again, I, I, so to me, you know, I've written about this for a long time. And um, to the extent that we're successful, more of that will happen. So, you know, it's an indication yeah. of some level of success. I mean, Facebook has obviously uh, not cooked up this idea in a vacuum. They're doing it in response to, Bitcoin, other crypto stuff, right? Um, but I feel, you know, clearly what they're doing is unimportant to to Bitcoin or, you know, any of the, the reasons that it exists. It's, you know, it might as well be PayPal. So like you said, Facebook's, you know, not a threat to them because they can control it, right? And they're just saying, you know, they're giving notice to these guys, that, hey, we're going to do it. Well, no, no kidding. And, and that's why to me, it's not a surprise. It's, you know, it's, it's a next step, but um, never shocked to see, you know, these kind of things as they move along. Um, there's, a, there's been some other statements that aren't so public, um, you know, recently that, that, are, that are even more interesting, I think, than the, the um, regulatory statement from, what is it, FATF, um, uh, to all their international members. That was, that was, that was probably more interesting, I think, than, than anything that, that Trump said. And I, but I think, you know, they're probably related. Um, yeah, yeah so, those statements were pretty harsh. Yeah, and what it in indicates to me is that, you know, there's no more security in white market Bitcoin stuff than there is in Facebook's money, right? It's not a threat. All you have to do is stroke your pen and it's gone. So, you know, some people see this as a positive event uh, because it's press. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't look at these things as positive or negative or value judgments or anything. These are just things that are going to happen. And, and the system, I mean, the whole point, um, of Bitcoin anyway, is that it's, it's meant to potentially withstand, um, state attack, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we always talk about it being permissionless and we can do all these things, but there's, a, you know, there's an awful lot of cheerleading about that. Like, you know, we can, we can thumb our nose at the man because we've got this technology and we can do what we want because, you know, it's permissionless. Well, what makes it permissionless? You know, I'm pretty sure that, uh, if, you know, if, if, if a law is passed that this is money laundering, you can't do it unless you make these changes. Um, it's not going to be, you know, done without permission in, in the white market. <laughs> you know, it's just not, it's it, by definition, it'll be a criminal activity and then it'll be black market money. So, that's that's the security model. There's no there's no defense against that whatsoever, um, and you know it's going it's going to take that kind of action for people to wake up and, and realize that. And everybody everybody's looking at Facebook, going, "Yeah, you guys, you don't know what you're doing. You know, stupid Facebook coin. You know, the government can control you. You can't control our Bitcoin." Well, yeah, it's true because there's no black market potential for Facebook, right? <laughs> but 
that's that's the difference. It's not like we have some protection against um, those regulatory actions at, say, Coinbase, right? Um, so, to me, again, not not surprising. Uh, you know, the first actions will be against um, central points of you know weakness. Well, the biggest is the white market, right? There's black market weakness as well. That's the security model of Bitcoin, you know, in action, trying to mm-hmm. trying to help people do it when they're not allowed to, when they don't want, when they, you know, they don't want to ask permission. Yeah, uh, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think that it's, it, for a long time, the state has not understood Bitcoin because it sees it as a, a payment platform instead of as a monetary base. And yeah. I think that that's, been really helpful to Bitcoin actually to allow it to slide under the radar for a decade now um, just because you know and, and this goes to why people have a hard time understanding Bitcoin in the first place to, to any outsider which is and, and why people think it's a Ponzi scheme or kind of write it off is because people think or are used to different payment systems mm-hmm. and uh, new money is a really difficult thing yeah wrap your head around that includes for regulators and state actors that don't see the threat before them. And, you know, I, I do hope that we're far enough along in Bitcoin's evolution that it can survive serious nation state attacks. If people start realizing what's possible. Um, And I, you know, I guess we'll just find out, but I I do think it's inevitable to some extent um, because, you know, the, the, the U.S. is not going to give up their control of the money supply without a fight. And I mean, yeah, I, I, I we tend to always talk about, you know, being I'm, I'm American, uh, you know, you are too, Connor. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, we at least try to, we tend to talk about everything in the context of the U.S. And so does everybody else around the world. Right. Yeah. But to me, that's kind of like the canonical definition of the state and the money. We use all these dollar examples and stuff, but it's not just the U.S. Every Every state, except for some micro states, you know, coins their own money for the same reason. Um, they all have an interest and they all work together. Um, and they all place certain controls on each other um, that are enforceable to a significant degree. So we shouldn't look at this as just the US just because, you know, somebody's speaking up. Yeah, the, the status as global reserve currency is important to the US um, because it effectively allows the U S to tax everybody that holds it in reserve. Right. And uh, not much they can do about that unless they find some other reserve. And that makes people actually think that Bitcoin will become, you know, the replacement for government reserves and it'll just sit underneath the financial system. And maybe, maybe the U S will fight be fighting against everybody else. Um, But that means every country, you know, in the world pretty much has surrendered their ability to tax via their money. It also means that if everybody's using Bitcoin in that manner, they, you know, a few states, you know, people that collaborate largely have the ability to do what they want with it, right? Um, if they're the only ones validating it, accepting it, uh, moving it around, they, they control the, they are the consensus, right? We have to do this independently ourselves. So, um, you know, it's, there's a, nothing, nothing here is surprising. Um, I'm actually surprised, you know, I don't, I don't think Bitcoin is having enough of an impact for them to really care. And again, I think that the Facebook thing is they look at it as potential overnight, big impact. Um, and I think, you know, Facebook was really kind of, really kind of dumb about how they did this. They should have just snuck it in as a feature and not told anybody and let it grow. Yeah. Other companies have done those kind of things, but they, you know, they came out with this, um, this, this big PR campaign about how they were going to, you know, do something significant to the money, you know, the money system and regulators take notice. Then. Yeah, but it wouldn't be, wouldn't be obvious. I mean, uh, uh, what is it? What is it worth? Like 500 billion dollar company, Facebook with, um, you know, with that much power and connections and, you know, lobbying. Um, I mean, I can't take it seriously when people, you know, say, okay, they just, you know, uh, brought out a white paper or some kind of business plan they must have they must have had discussions before uh, you know with the with the with the with the concrete decision makers in the regulatory agencies or whatever maybe even with the uh, you know federal reserve I, you know i mean what do we know i'm just asking and uh, the links i sent you by the way that discussion draft is sort of a draft for a bill uh if that becomes effective 
wouldn't that mean like the end of Libra to prohibit large platform utilities from being financial institution or being affiliated with well, a blah, blah? Well, I mean, the definition of large is clearly intended to target Facebook. You know, it's like mm -hmm. singling out, you know, a handful of companies. Um, but those, you know, just imagine you take, you know, three zeros off that definition, which wouldn't be too hard. Right. Mm -hmm. um, now it affects all of the Bitcoin or, you know, if you make the number smaller, I don't know exactly what the company sizes are, but all of a sudden, you know, all the bit, Bitcoin white market, you know, central points of, you know, failure have just failed. That's all it takes is some zeros off that document and some sig and a signature on it. You know, um, I mean, they all clearly fit well within those definitions. There, you know, um, so uh, as to whether Facebook, you know, should have or did talk to some regulators about it. Um, you know, I always talk about the state as an, as an entity, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot of individuals, a lot of different people. They have different opinions. They make, you know, they, 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 they make a guess. They think how things are going to work out and other people don't agree. And so there's, there's definitely internal conflict within uh, this organization. And maybe somebody said, no, that's stupid. We're not going to let them do that after, after they, they did get some, some indication. I mean, I know these, anybody, Facebook doesn't operate in the financial world, not the way, you know, um, other you know money transmitters do and people that do are constantly talking to their regulators you know they probably live in regulators in these places mm -hmm. and um, Facebook just hasn't lived in that world I mean you can when you read that document you can even kind of see it like um, we're not going to let these tech companies be money companies well there's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of money companies but they put them in a separate category Right. It's almost like, you know, what is the old Glass-Steagall uh, thing, right? We're not going to let you be an investor and be a banker at the same time. Um, so politicians definitely recognize the power of, you know, these communication networks, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. And, um, and I think it scares them to see that power being applied to, you know, money and banking. Um, and so... Yeah, it was more like, you know, hey, Google, Microsoft, Apple, you know, Apple's got their Apple Pay, you know, they're seeing these tech companies move into finance in a big way. And now the line has been crossed where this vague idea of cryptocurrency is kind of now, you know, it's not just PayPal anymore and eBay, right? It's, it's Facebook and, and something that claims it can replace the dollar, not just move it around. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's an important moment. I mean, it's, it's a weird time to have tech companies or any company um, creating their own currency and, and thinking that they can, you know, create something that uh, yeah. their company is so large that it's almost like uh, they're outside of the state based system. I mean, they're like a global company with its own. It, it, it's It's weird because it starts to you start to have companies that have similar aspects as nation states. Like, all right, now Facebook has billions of users. It has its own currency. Um, you know, these like meta states. Um, but, yeah, but and size is not what makes a state in any way. I mean, the people, people always make that claim. They're powerful. Yeah, they're powerful. They have the power to give people what they want. Right? If people don't want to use it, they don't have to use it. People want it. They like it. They like the network. I mean, for all of its negatives, you know, and, and things that people know about privacy that is going on, people still do it voluntarily. Yeah. So definitely. the state, state power is very different, right? I mean, the, the nature of the state is it, is it makes people do things they don't want to do. If they did want to do them, they would be done in the market. Right. So yeah. no, I, very, I think that's a know, valid point. I mean, we all know that, but I, it's just where it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, these, these companies are not in competition with state power and, and I don't, you know, but money is, is important. It's a, it's a, it's a major form of taxation and all the state has to do is tell them no and they're done. It's, there's no power struggle there. Um, I mean, people tend to think uh, there's, there's a certain amount of people that um, think that Bitcoin is secured politically. And I, I think that's such a contradiction in concepts, right? Like if it's, if it becomes really popular, there's no way they can do this. Well, Facebook's pretty popular and, you know, <laughs> billions of users and they, and they can just step right and say no. Um, and, it, you know, they, they did go ahead and take the world's most popular money and make it not, not legal money in the U.S. and, and a lot of places around the world for a while um, and, and stole it from people. So those kind of arguments uh, 
don't really make any sense. The power that the state has will be used when they think, um, you know, they need to use it to preserve things that are important to them. Mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin hasn't been important because, you know, they look at the, they look at the tax revenues, it all looks the same, right? We're not mm -hmm. having any impact um, to them. Um, we have potential impact and, and we have, you know, usefulness in a lot of scenarios, but, um, that, that's always, that's, you know, the, when I look at the threat model and the evolution of, 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 you know, stages of Bitcoin, we're still in what I call the honeymoon phase. It's just not, it's not important enough. Um, even though the Facebook thing is not Bitcoin, the problem for the state is the same unless they do something about it. Right. So they care all of a sudden. So what's a realistic scenario? I mean, uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, we can't make predictions, but what's what's realistic then? You know, let's say in a year I, or two for... I, I think the regulators will step in on, you know, Facebook and other like entities and give them a list of controls that if you do these things, you're, you're okay. <laughs> um, and that will, I mean... That, that you means know, cooperation. That, that means data, uh, you know, uh, providing data control, right? Surveillance. Well, I mean, uh, it certainly means surveillance, right? It's already been explicitly stated. Yeah. So if you look at my, my writing on like the Fed coin objectives, like if you were going to make a coin that, that the feds were okay with, that looks something like Bitcoin, they really only need two changes, right? So Bitcoin is sec secured independently. You know, the, Bitcoin's a market. It's a, it's a market for transaction confirmation. It's a market between miners and merchants. The people that want the transactions confirmed and the people that, you know, want to do it and they trade for it. And the trade is in fees. So just like any other market, each party in the market, right, set of parties, the cons consumers and the merchants. So in this case, the, the merchants that are selling stuff for Bitcoin are the customers of the miners right they're buying confirmation like merchants buy visa confirmations and the, the merchants are securing their side of it you know which is their basically their wallets their keys their money um and that's secured by enforcing consensus rules and miners are securing their side of, of the market and that's done by you know ensuring that they can confirm the most profitable transactions so um the state wants a piece of both of those security models right it, on the on the consensus side of things they want to be able to create their own units of the money right they want monetary policy as a euphemism for taxing through uh, inflation so change one consensus rule which basically says you know if uh, it's it's sort of euphemistic but this is basically how it would would have to work a, a transaction that that you accept you, you have to accept a transaction as new money, essentially a Coinbase, right? If it's signed by this, you know, key. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now anytime the state wants to, it just signs some new money and there's new money. And it has that, and then it has that power. All that has to happen is all the, all the people who accept Bitcoin have to add that one rule, mm -hmm. um, the inflation rule. And on the mining side, um, they want to be able to see what everybody's doing. And the way you do that is you ensure that every transaction that's legally confirmed has also been signed by the state, right? So in order to get your transaction confirmed, you would have to surrender whatever they want in order for them to sign your transaction, which is exactly how the existing financial system works. Provide your ID, tell us, you know, over a certain amount of money, tell us what you're doing with it, right? Um, you know, anything you, you currently need to, to, uh, to move money in the existing financial system, you'd, you'd have to surrender. So, so there's a censorship rule on the mining side, on all miners, and there's a inflation rule for all merchants. But those two rule changes, you know, well, they're not necessarily rule validity, right? Every every tra transaction has to be signed. It's just a, a miner would have to make sure they did it, or they'd be money launders, right? But um, but you could certainly make it a consensus rule, that, right? Right? Every every transaction has to be signed, or every block has to be signed by the state or an agent of it. And, you know, you can automate that process and every, every block it gets reviewed, gets permission, and it takes maybe a few days before your money gets through. Right. And so now it starts looking like, yeah. uh, like what we already have. Um, so I, I see at some point that, you know, if Bitcoin becomes important enough, there's just something like that, a piece of paper that says those things that, that gets enforced on every big money transmitter and every big miner and every merchant who accepts Bitcoin. Um, 
So right now that tends to look like a small number of companies. There's not a lot of independent merchants who run their own node and validate their own, you know, money. Um, so that can be enforced pretty centrally. And, uh, you know, then the, then the next step for Bitcoin is that people keep doing it anyway. And, you know, it's black market. It's meant to be able to survive independently, but it has to be done at small scale. It has to be done hidden. And that's, you know, it has to be done by a lot of individuals, therefore, not, not one big entity, both mining and merchanting. And that's the nature of, you know, it, it, as far as system security, that's why privacy, that's, that's why um, decentralization matters. You can operate at small scale. Um, that, that, that and user friendliness. The... And user friendliness. I mean, I think this is missing because I think if it were really much more easier, user friendlier and, you know, for the average person, uh, I mean, I'm already overwhelmed yeah. by, by all of this, you know, uh, people would just, you know, sure. at least Yeah, start... I mean, it has to be, it has, people have to be, get some useful insight out of it. It has to be usable and, and everything. But basically, you know, all, all, all security comes down to human beings. There's no, there's no security inherent in, com, you know, computers or guns or you know, um, these tools. The tools have to be ultimately used by people. And... Um, if somebody walks into your store and says, you know, you're a criminal money launderer, you're using this tool. Is, is the, is, is the Bitcoin node going to jump up and tell that guy to, you know, to get out? <laughs> no, you know, he's not going to stop you from getting dragged out and, you know, put in money launderer, you know, prison. So uh, people have to be able to, to use the tools and to resist those actions. And there's an awful lot of people that, you aren't going to be willing to take that risk. Um, so that'll be an interesting you know, point if and when it comes. But um, if Bitcoin is impactful enough, I, I don't like to say successful. I think Bitcoin's already successful, very successful. But, but you know, it, it, when, it be, when it becomes, if it becomes impactful enough, I keep, it's impossible for me to imagine those things don't happen. And then people will realize where the security is really coming from, right? It's not coming from hash power, cryptography or math or anything like that it's coming from people resisting mm -hmm. um yeah those were those were a lot of good points and i'm i wrote down a lot thinking about what you're going through i think um that you're definitely right in saying that nation states are not afraid to take stuff from you and uh gold was taken from people that, that were considered hoarders and you know that's something that went through past took it from average Americans, validated by the Supreme Court. Um, and so, you know, this is not something that is impossible. And I think that people do overestimate um, Bitcoin censorship resistance in that way. If, if we think, okay, what would happen tomorrow if the U.S. government passes a law, similar to the one that we were looking at earlier, that says, all right, all Bitcoin from here on out is illegal to use it in transactions, but right now we're going to give you a fair market value of $10,000 a coin and you can sell it to us. And if you don't sell it to us uh, and we find you transacting with it, then we'll throw the book at you. People would, I, I think Bitcoin would just fall apart. Um, at least in, in the short term, in, in terms of, you know, it's, it's currently on a really strong path and I think that would really... Um, be damaging to Bitcoin in the short term. I think that in the long term, the black market effects and the, the fact that Bitcoin could survive something like that is important. But I think that people um, do underestimate the power of a nation state realizing the appropriate threat to um, the money supply. Um, and so the question is like, how, what, what incentives are already baked in that prevent a state from doing something like that because they can do it. And yeah. I've, I've really heard two arguments generally, um, which is, well, one, you know, as it continues to evolve, then politicians will become Bitcoiners and, you know, they'll kind of do the covert uh, sabotage from the inside and they'll all, you know, be secretly selling out um, to, to make sure their Bitcoin does well. Uh, I don't find that super compelling in the near term. I don't think that's basically like they did with gold, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the other is that 
um, any state doing this puts itself at a, at a competitive disadvantage. And if a state does realize, let's say the United States does realize that Bitcoin is a massive threat and it tries to ban it, then um, it's going to be at a disadvantage to other countries like Russia or China. Let's say they allow it and, you know, it's effectively shot itself on the foot by um, banning technology that others are going to use against it. And I, I don't think that's a super strong argument either because no. just like gold, they took all the gold and that's how they got a lot of gold. And, you know, if, if they do think Bitcoin is like, if, if U.S. regulators or, or, you know, actors think that Bitcoin is the future of where people are going to store their value, then banning it and taking it under the uh, guise of it's a super dangerous thing. We need to make sure no one uses it for our own safety. Consumer yeah. protection. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we know it's best for you. Just hand it over. We'll, we'll take it off your hands. Right. Dangerous thing. Um, so yeah. both of those are, and I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm curious, Eric, what your thoughts are, what other arguments are kind of used to say that this isn't going to happen? Well, uh, it's really, to me, those aren't arguments that it won't happen. They're just, you know, arguments. Um, but you know, you picked, you picked a couple of them. I, I always hear the same ones. Uh, there's only a handful and, and they get, they get circulated by people who speak and, and, and believe in there, the people pick them up. And, you know, uh, there's the, what I call the, the Hearn error. <laughs> I had this debate, a uh, short thing with him on Bitcoin dev years ago. And, and he, you know, he comes out and he wrote a little paper that, you know, Bitcoin is secured by popularity, essentially. You know? And he mm -hmm. said the state can't ban popular things. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a common error. Uh, and if you believe that, you know, um, you know, you're believing it against all historical precedent because the state pretty much only bans popular things. Um, they're the most profitable. So if it's not very popular, nobody's doing it. You know, and, you know, you read the, there was a, I was just in San Francisco and they, the city passed or proposed a, this ordinance to ban vaping for, you know, certain, certain ages. And the argument was explicitly, this has become very popular. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we didn't care. We didn't care how, you know, you know, let's say, let's say it was poison and it was killing people. We didn't care if it only killed a small number of people, but you know, it's doing it a lot. So now it's, um, so, uh, yeah, popularity is what attracts regulation and control and take a look at the Facebook scenario, right? So that, that's not exactly. a very compelling argument. If you look at the long, long list of things that have been banned and regulated, um, there t tend to be the most popular things like free speech, books, prostitution, gambling, alcohol, gold, right? The, you just go on and on and on. So it, it, that's, that's to me, not a very compelling argument. And then you have, um, so that's, that's an argument that they, they can't in, or they have self-interest, right? Like the, the one you said, where it states, individuals, yeah. sovereigns, self-interest, if the U.S. bans it, then everybody else is going to benefit from that. Um, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to suggest that Bitcoin is secured by states. Right? I mean, there's 200 and some odd countries in the world, and that's not a very big um, pool of individuals um, securing Bitcoin, right? Like, like, and how many of them actually operate independently or have any, any power at all. So um, the, whole, the whole security model of Bitcoin is based on the fact that it's not a political money. The status quo is political money, right? So if Bitcoin is to pin its security model on the decisions of states, it's just a political money. They change, you know, states make different decisions. They change their minds. They do what they want. And that, and is that, so now we got to go to the, we got to go to the ballot box to determine whether, you know, we get this change to Bitcoin. Is that how it's going to work? Right. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of a, a naive argument on, on one level and the other, point I think I've made it in, on this show before is that uh, it doesn't really matter. States aren't the important thing to Bitcoin. It's the, it's the size of the black market, you know, relative to the people that want to stop it. So if, a, if, you know, some country wants to, you know, if San Marino or something wants to join the black market, great. You know, now there's one more person you know, that's using Bitcoin, right? Who has that, has the control over all those people in the country. So they're the decision maker. They get to decide on in that country, you know, these are going to be the consensus rules if mm -hmm. you're operating in the white market. So yeah, maybe we get, you know, 20 or 30 more individuals, in, you know, into the consensus. Um, 
or they let all these people do things. But again, they're, they're letting them do it. It's permission based, right? Uh, so yeah, there could be, there certainly would be little, you know, little or bigger islands of, of black market that have state um, um, approval. Um, but the ultimately what matters is how much, you know, how much economic power can the individuals in those places generate? Um, because that's ultimately what's going to pay for the hash power that's going to keep the sensor out. Um, I so wonder, that's, there's jurisdictional arbitrage, yeah. you know, popularity, those, those arguments and the ones that you made as well. Those are the ones you see. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, well, okay. An another thing I, I was kind of thinking of is I agree that they would have the ability to carry out the attack right now and, and try to prevent Bitcoin from, you know, continuing on its rise. But I feel like in a way that does, or I, I guess the way that, um, the way I answer this argument um, is that globally we are looking at a monetary system that's failing and central banks around the world have very little ammunition left rates are extremely extremely low during the next downturn there's no telling what's going to happen and i think the credibility of central banks around the world are all simultaneously in a really weak spot right now and i do think that that's one of the things that uh is potentially the, the saving grace for bitcoin is that you know if this was in the 80s where we had decades left of central banks being able to survive then you know Bitcoin wouldn't be that appealing to me. But given the, uh, and I think this is like all the Austrian side of it, the, the fact that we believe there's an impending crisis of monetary credibility, um, then suddenly Bitcoin's uh, ability to fight against these central banks seems more valid. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Bitcoin becomes more useful when the alternatives get more expensive. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap to use Bitcoin. It's not easy, um, at least not now. And, it, you know, it's it's slow, slowly maybe, uh, you know, actually using Bitcoin yourself is slowly maybe getting easier and better. Uh, I work on that myself. Um, I make tools for other people to do it. It's mm -hmm. very important. Um, but, you know, where it's a competing it's a competing option for people for different scenarios and you take a place like venezuela you know we, we talk about what they may or may not be doing with bitcoin but it's a it's a good current example of a situation where it gets more useful so taking the risk of using it if it's not legal is worth it or even if it's legal you know going through the hassle of using it now becomes worth it to people um because they need to get money from overseas. They need to buy things. You know, you can't buy things with the new Boulevard. So, um, you know, that's, I, I had a, I had a contact I met down here a few years ago um, who had been in construction and then the boom hit and lost a lot. And he's Venezuelan. And he was, this is, you know, before things got really bad in Venezuela, it's been getting bad for a long time, yeah. but he was, uh, he was, he got into Bitcoin and he started selling mining rigs on credit down there and just shipping them down you know no charge and then uh, people would mine on discount state energy and then um you know send them back the, the bitcoin to pay for the rigs and then buy some more and just you know keep doing that and uh um then with some you know i asked them well, what do they do with the bitcoin you know it's like oh they you know they, they buy and sell things among themselves they, they they go online and they get stuff and have it shipped you still get stuff delivered to the mail um so those you know, to the, even to the extent it's not true, it doesn't really matter. Those are the types of scenarios where, you know, using the complex, you know, p potentially risky uh, regulatory money uh, becomes worth it. So if you have a, you know, it used to be every time there's a financial uh, collapse, a monetary collapse, people just went back to gold. And, right. you know, in Zimbabwe, for example, every, you know, like the four or five times their money actually collapsed during one dictatorship, they always went back to dollars, euro, and rand. And I was there a couple of years ago and, you know, that's what, that's, that was the currency dollars, euro and rent because they, yeah. you know, the last Zimbabwe dollar had failed and they were just introducing a new one. They, you know, they called it bond notes, you know, purchase it one for one for a dollar at the bank. But so people go back to the next, you know, best money that, that they can use. And in that case, it was another country's fiat. Um, 
And so it, it's, it should be clear to people that Bitcoin has competition from other monies and uh, will always have that. Um, people will always have other options. So the idea that eventually everybody just uses Bitcoin and the, and the, it, the price gets extraordinary and, and, uh, and because nobody has alternatives, right? Well, that itself is another, you know, you, that should be evident from the fact that pe people always have alternatives. And um, um, when, when, when those alternatives start getting taken away, you know, Bitcoin becomes more valuable, um, more useful to people. So, I, you know, when you talk about like global financial collapse, we're really talking about monetary collapse, right? The, right. The, the, the source of all this collapse is, is not very um, hard to see. It's just debt, right? The, the state spends more than it takes in and it taxes people to but but if you think about it you know that the, the 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 monetary system is is a way for the state to print more money therefore have the ability to tax people who have the money and that's how they offset the debt well that that debt's already been paid right once they print the money and issue it it's done i mean it, they don't owe anybody anything for it um and so you know the money eventually devalues and if you get into a lot of that you go to a country like Zimbabwe or, or Venezuela, it's really obvious, right? State doesn't have money to pay the troops, to pay off the people who don't have jobs. Um, so they print some more money and all of a sudden you get into a hyperinflation scenario. Why? It's not happening because the banks are, you know, fractional lending, right? Yeah, it's happening I because totally the state is just overspending, it, you know, so it's not overspending though, actually, it's just spending a lot. And that's resulting in a lot of taxation. And that taxation is depreciating the money. And um, it's very easy to stop that. This has happened many times throughout history. I think this was happening in, there's an example in Germany pre-World War II where uh, uh, maybe I may be sort of representing my example, but there, there are a few cases uh, where, you know, you have hyperinflation and somebody says, well, geez, how do we stop this? <laughs> you know? And the advisor comes in and says, stop stop printing the money right they do and it stops overnight it just stops oh my god how did that happen i thought we you know i thought the financial system was no we just stopped printing the money and now there's no more inflation but now you yeah you can't spend the money right so so you have to stop spending as much that's it so you know people paint this picture of this like house of cards financial system and that's not really what's happening what's happening is as long as they can keep spending other people's money and getting some benefit out of it, they'll do it. And then eventually it comes to an end and they have to stop. Right. Right. And then they don't want to give up power. So they, they just start taking stuff with guns, you know, mm -hmm. but um, um, you, you can't predict the collapse of that kind of system very easily. You can predict the fill, you know, the money going into hyperinflation, but then just start a new money. Right? Um, so it's, it's easy to see how these things work, but what I'm, what I'm getting is it's hard to predict when they happen. You know, yeah. who, who would have predicted Cuba would have lasted this long? Or North Korea, right? Um, and I, as a kid, I always thought the Soviet Union and the Cold War was going to be around forever. Never thought it would end, right? And when's the war on terror going to end? You never, so these things are very, they're easy to see, you know, eventually happening, but very hard to predict when they're going to happen. And so you were talking about how, like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we had some time, but now we really don't. I look at that as like, well, I don't know, you know, how much time we've got. Um, but in the, in the old days, people used to flee to gold and, uh, that was the, you know, the, the last refuge uh, for sound money, gold and metals. And today that's not really very feasible. And that's, that's, what's interesting about Bitcoin because you can't send gold over a wire. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's probably why nobody cared anymore whether people used it as a money, right? It's not really very useful in a modern economy. Bitcoin is the you know, no commodity money can be sent over a wire. So, um, I mean, no fiat can actually be sent over a wire either. All you're sending over a wire is, is monetary substitute for fiat um, credit. So um, Bitcoin is, so there's, there's, there's credit, you know, account-based credit against fiat or commodity or whatever, uh, which is easily controlled. Um, and then there's Bitcoin. There's really no other options. So in that system, you know, global financial system where people want to move money around electronically, um, Bitcoin is really the only option. I mean, when I say Bitcoin, I don't mean one chain. Right? This technology um, is the only option. That's what's really interesting. We can't go back to what we used to go back to in the past.
not 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 if you want to maintain anything like what we have. So do you think all these factors are compounding in whatever it's called Gresham Gresham's law, Lindy effect, more you know sellability, or as you say, you know when it's taken or when people understand more, they you know they just tend to you know be attracted and you know because they understand it, the source, the the cause of of you know of their symptoms they will eventually go to Bitcoin. I mean, this is what I'm hoping for, but it's, I love these talks because it's always, you know, Eric is so good at, at sobering up people. <laughs> you know, I, now, uh, I understand, you know people, no, now I understand why uh, Bitcoin is don't listen to you because you're so like, you know, this is reality, you know, face it or die. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, ju you know, I, I, I try very hard. I, you know, I'm sure they're not perfect, but I try very hard to not make value judgments about these things. I don't say what's good or bad. I don't, and I don't make predictions um, without heavy qualification, right? I, this, this is what the security model is designed to prevent against. This is what could happen, but you know, what will happen, when it'll happen, um, when is usually the thing, you know, once you get into predictions, that, that's hard. You know, what will happen? Yeah. Well, if, if they care enough, then they will act, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know. I, 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 I like to think of it as explaining, not cheerleading, but not, you know, not, because I tend to be, I, I think, more realistic about these things or think more about what's actually happening, uh, people think I'm negative on Bitcoin. And, no, you're why logical. No, you're <laughs> why, logical. Why would I be here? No, you're I, logical. I wanna, yeah. If you want to see it work, you have to understand how it actually works. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's become like a, a thing of mine to just get people to understand so that when they act, they act in a way that where their energy is being put to uh, good use. Mm -hmm. And I, in the last couple of days, I've, I've written a couple of topics and I don't know, I'm up to like 74, 75 right now. And it's usually because I, I come across somebody who's got this idea and I'm like, that's not really productive to our ecosystem. And um, if you understood that you're, you're just burning capital, you know, your own energy and time on this idea, then, then you might go and do something else that, that, that is net productive. So it's not me discouraging people from Bitcoin. It's me trying to encourage people to do things that matter to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's all these different attempts to make different kind of coins to solve the supposed problems that Bitcoin has. Um, and, you know, environmental reasons or um, security reasons or usability reasons. And, and I, I just like point out these you know, the economic effect of, of some of these, some of these things. One of my, one of my favorites it just kind of came up as a long Twitter thread going on about it right now with the, with the Chia project. Did you see that? With what? You know, about, about, about two years ago, I, I think it was around then I encountered Chia and I was like, so, you know, I, I mean, I, I didn't, I, I'm not, I'm not technocratic about these things. You can get in the white paper and do the math and go out there. I just look at the high level principles. Right? Yeah. And okay, the supposed, all the effort, capital being burned on a project like this is, is an effort to make a Bitcoin where um, we don't need to consume as much energy to achieve the same level of security, right? We, should, we can, and you know, a lot of proof of stake operate, you know, kind of the same way. And the idea was we'll, we'll, we'll use kind of proof of, a proof of space. memory, you know, they call yeah. space, right? So proof that I have store, you know, independent storage capacity. And as a result, all this unused storage capacity can uh, can be useful to Bitcoin, and you know people don't have to keep burning energy on it to make it um, to make it secure. And you know, I'm like, it sounds sounds great if we can if we can achieve like you know less cost uh, in terms of I don't know energy consumption than Bitcoin and achieve the same thing. Sounds sounds magical, but it doesn't it doesn't happen, and so. You know, it's not like I want to discourage people from from doing something that's productive. But when you when you yeah. look at something and realize that, that all this time and effort is is not going to produce anything of net value, then you know, I say something. <laughs> so, so the I, I thought that was a really interesting one because um, because the idea of of the, you know the security model is that you know you're creating this cost barrier. Um, people pay fees for transactions or there's inflation compensation um, for miners. And that, if you, if you change that from a proof that I did some work to a proof that I have some space, 
uh, to achieve the same basic objective, then the cost of every block, say it's the same, same it's achieved the same level of utility as Bitcoin and people are paying the same amount to use it, you know, mine it, whatever. Um, then they say the cost for every block is 10,000 bucks and, or not 10,000. What are we at now? That's a, that's a coin. Uh, hundred thousand. What's a, what's a, what's a block yeah, cost like right a, now? It's like 150,000. Yeah. So, so let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars every 10 minutes is being, is, is being consumed. Um, and so you have some space. It costs you nothing. It's spare space on your hard drive, you know, and you give it up to this project and you prove you have that space. Well, what did that cost you? It cost you nothing. So you get your, you know, you get your hundred thousand dollars every once in a while for doing nothing. And, you know, anybody who looks at a rational market goes, well, geez, if I had like 10,000 times the space of that guy, you know, I get 10,000 times more money than he's getting, right? How much is it going to cost me? Uh, you know, a few hundred bucks. <laughs> so, so what happens is you drive, um, work or energy cost in terms of you know just grinding out hashes into manufacturing cost people mm -hmm. just keep buying space and you can't stop buying it because once you have it you know you need to spend more money again the next the, the the reward keeps coming in but you've already bought the stuff now there's no net cost to you or anybody else the the number of bytes has to constantly increase at a rate that would equal the amount of the reward so a hundred thousand dollars in hard drives being purchased every 10 minutes right around the world that's an extraordinarily large amount of you know consumption of energy because the hard drive you know producing a hundred thousand dollars of the hard drives and shipping them and installing them is going to consume about the same amount of energy as burning a hundred thousand dollars on hashing but it's just a lot more simple so i look at it and go okay well you know from a high level we've achieved the same thing. You have proof of work, right? It's yep. just being done in a, in a different way. Um, and net, net, nothing's been achieved. It's not more decentralized. It's not, you know, so why spend the effort on doing this? Well, it's because there's a lack of understanding, right? And I think that project from what I've just followed in this thread today, I didn't, I didn't talk to, I just wrote the thing up and moved on, but I, I, can't, I told them about it a couple of years ago. And I found out that they do understand the problem and they're trying to find a way around it. You know, they're trying, they've changed the model and they're toying and they haven't settled on one. It's starting, you know, when I was having the discussion, it was starting to feel like, you know, Ethereum, <laughs> you know, you know, it's all done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're just going to keep changing it until we figure it out. Right. And uh, so it's not, you know, bad motive or scammy or anything like that. It's just um, lack of understanding. So I, I try to understand these things from a high level and publish as much as I can about what I understand. And then I discuss it. So I make sure that I've got, you know, all the viewpoints and, and, uh, and, and, uh, haven't made errors and, um, and try to, that's a tool for people. So when they're, when they're vetting an idea, um, they can, they can, they can have that tool to work with. So to me, it's not negative at all. Um, it's, it's, it's encouraging of the system to put capital into the right, into, into places that, that again, trying to avoid value judgments, not right or wrong, but into places yeah. that are more productive uh, for my objectives, which are to see uh, a permissionless money, you know, permissionless electronic money um, take hold. Um, it's the same thing with white market business. You know, I'm great. You want to do that, but it's not productive to that end. Right. You make yeah. a web API and you get like, you know, a billion users on it. Great. You've done nothing for Bitcoin. Right? Um, it's not negative on Bitcoin. It's negative um, on wasted capital. I, I agree. And I think that, you know, it really comes down to economic fundamentals. And I think that it really is, uh, you know, a classic economic misunderstanding of, you know, the broken window fallacy, but in the context of mining or something like that, like, yeah, um, it's the same kind of thing. Paul, yeah, Paul Stork did a great piece on this, debunking it the same way proof of stake. I mean, it's like, you know, when you abstract it one level away, you just think that somehow the costs aren't there. And the costs certainly are there. Yeah. And, and, you know, so... In a lot it, of cases... I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that the fact that people keep trying these things, just don't, like, of course, they're not going to work because it's based on this fundamental economic fallacy and yeah. i guess that's that's also why i really appreciate the things you do is because you know you break it apart on a logical economic level from these you know fundamentals that we know um to be economically true 
and then you you build a model off of that. Um, that's really important. Appreciate it. Yeah, and proof of, proof of stakes is just so simple. You know, I people make write white papers, and there's all this math, and you know, I I I could figure this stuff out, but what happens is most people just get lit. They get overwhelmed. They look at, you, know, you can't analyze this, right? You need a PhD yeah. in, in, yeah. in microbiology or something to, to figure out what they're doing. <laughs> and, and I just look at it and go, what is it? Proof of stake. Okay. It's, it's, it's not censorship resistant, right? It's, it's that simple because th there's only two kinds of proof. There's proof of what is on the chain. I call that internal. And there's proof of something that's not on the chain. Mm -hmm. And everything that's not on the chain that can be proven reduces to energy, right? Even if you're going out and, you know, counting blades of grass, it, it, it reduces to somebody paying somebody to go do it. And, you know, that's capital burn, that's energy consumption. You got to feed them and everything like that, right? So, so, you know, what's, okay. So anything that's proof of that, that's proof provided by what's on the chain is proof of stake. It's some, some, you know, your authority to order the next block of transactions is based on your stake and some probability of, you know, you being able to use it. And external proof is, is not based in any way on what's on the chain. So you have two choices, right? One works, one doesn't. And the reason proof of stake doesn't work is because once you achieve uh, sufficient stake, however that's defined, you control the future right by from the past you control the future so now the and there's because you control the future the few the, the they can't get you out there's no way to get the sensor out right it, it will just reject any of your transactions or inputs to the chain um and so you know people argue well it's against self-interest well the the self-interest is coming from not somebody who's interested in your money but who's interested in protecting their own it's a competitor so improperly modeling the threat and um, op trying to operate under this assumption that as long as it's 50%, it's the same as proof of work, right? Proof of work, you get 50% of the hash power. Okay, now the, now the sensor controls the money. So I don't, you know, I don't believe anybody ever kind of properly articulated that. So I spent some time on that because the, there's an important difference between the two 50%, right? One is you can never get them out that the whole money is defunct or per perpetually censored or whatever they wanted to achieve. And in the case of Bitcoin, you can always add more energy, right? Mm -hmm. Energy comes from outside. You can, you can, you can go and build a mine and get, grab some energy and add more and push the sensor out. Um, so clear. It's, it's just so, you know, it's at that point, you just, you just see the words proof of stake and you go, Oh, <laughs> sorry, it's not going to work. And it, you don't have to waste any time on it. Um, and there's a lot of things like that, several of them, like, you know, if it's not fee based, there's no way to pay to get the sensor out. Inflation only money. So, you know, I've seen both yeah. proof, proof, yeah. proof of stake with inflation only. Okay, great. You know, um, so who's, you know, you can't get the sensor out. So it's moot, but now you go to proof of work with inflation only. And you realize that when the, when the sensor gets 51% hash power, there's no way to pay new miners to come in and mine illegal transactions. No way to give them a premium because every miner gets the same return no matter what they're doing. Right. Okay. So inflation only doesn't work. It has to be fee based. These are simple principles, but somebody has got to figure them out and write them down and, yeah. and people have to, I'm at that point, but now people have to kind of come to understand them. And uh, so I created a topic called the crypto dynamic principles, right? Three, three principles that essentially define Bitcoin. Hmm. And they're all visible in the white paper. Um, and they're, they're, you know, they're necessary to being a secure, be, being a Bitcoin and anything that's not doesn't hasn't shown itself to be secure uh, against these things. So, okay, some simple principles, follow those principles, and you might have a chance, right? You might, you might make a really shitty Bitcoin, you know, you're, you might make one with terabyte blocks. And so it can't operate at small scale. Um, but where's the line there, right? It's, it's one, two megabyte, four megabyte blocks. Is that okay? There's, these are ambiguous and arbitrary choices. So, yeah. but at least the principle is, is correct. You might make a shitty car, but you know, okay, it's a car. Right? Um, uh, so that's kind of like, I, I think of it as like Newton's laws, you know, with the laws of thermodynamics, there's these principles here that, that, that hold, these are why we call it Bitcoin. This is how it's secured. Um, and uh, okay, now it's simple. Then spend some spend some time working in those areas, um, or or spend some time proving that there's 
there's an error there, right? Not through demonstration. You know, this is, these are logical, you know, epistemological kind of arguments. You could go in there and, you know, write, find the error in the, in the, uh, in the proof. Yeah. Connor, why don't you give us uh, your thoughts, your final thoughts and rebuttal, because I'm going to wrap this up. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I don't even think I have a rebuttal. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think Eric and I come from similar background, or maybe not backgrounds, but modes of thought. I mean, I did debate for seven years, uh, then I did philosophy, and uh, now I'm in law school. And, you know, you learn to yep. make logical arguments and, you know, whatever – lines up and you can you know, kind of stack up on both sides is where you fall. And uh, I think that, you know, that's just, and, and that's also the beauty of Austrian economics and praxeology and the, the nature of um, taking economic logical arguments about how humans act and, and um, you know, that that's why we're here. So I, I, I it's not a rebuttal. Uh, I, I think that Eric is doing a great job. Yeah, definitely. Well, Guys, I uh, um, really appreciate that it was really sobering. <laughs> <laughs> At least we managed to get off the top the topic of Trump and. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the intention behind it. Okay, no, no, but uh, it was really uh, I love it. It's a very holistic approach. Uh, you guys, we always find some avenues to uh, to close this up. Anyway, um, thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon again, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, so you know. And uh, put put up your articles, you know, uh, your your links in the show notes. And yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thanks Talk for to having you us. Bye bye. Yeah.